Hello again. Uh, good morning, good morning. Again, my name's Jeff M. Field, and I'm pitch hitting for Pastor Dave uh, today. A Sunday school teacher asked one of her students why it was important for her to be quiet during the church service. The little girl responded, because people are sleeping. <laughs> Hopefully there won't be too much of that happening today. Before we get into God's word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for being our God and for saving us. And we ask that you would help us to grow in our love for you. Help us to worship you as a congregation in these next few minutes. Cleanse our hearts and minds from the things that hinder our relationship with you. And help us to learn from your word. Help us to be changed by it and help us to proclaim its truth to the world. We give this time over to you. Uh, Today, we will be looking at John chapter 4. And this is a passage about the lostness of mankind, the effects of sin, and the grace of our Savior. So that's the entire sermon in one sentence in case you don't get through uh, the rest of it. It's the lostness of mankind, the effects of sin, and the grace of our Savior. Chapter 4, verse 3. Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jesus had been in Judea and was heading back to Galilee. He did not have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. He could have gone around Samaria, as most religious Jews would do, but Jesus had to go through Samaria for spiritual reasons. Jesus had a divine appointment with a Samaritan woman in Sychar. Jesus wanted to turn a sinner into a true worshiper of him. Luke 19 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus seeks out those who are lost. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The sixth hour is about noon. The normal time for women to get water was either early in the morning or later in the afternoon when it was cooler. This woman appears to be without close friends since she came to draw water when no one else was around. The woman, woman may not have wanted uh, to be associated, the other woman may not have wanted to associate with her because of her immoral lifestyle. Jesus asked the Samaritan woman for a drink because he was tired and thirsty from his journey to Sychar. The Gospel of John emphasizes that Jesus is both fully man and fully God. As fully man, Jesus becomes tired and thirsty. Let's take a sidebar and understand the Samaritans. The Samaritans were people from the ten northern tribes who became racially and religiously mixed. The twelve tribes of united Israel divided into two kingdoms in 931 B.C. The ten northern tribes tribes were still called Israel, The two southern tribes were called Judah. King Jeroboam, the very first king of the northern kingdom, set up a false form of Jehovah worship. He set up two golden calves at Dan and Bethel, the northern and southern parts of the kingdom, and he led Israel into idolatry. King Jeroboam discouraged the Israelites in the northern kingdom from going to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple as they were commanded to do. The Assyrians captured the ten northern tribes in 722 B.C. and deported approximately 50,000 Israelites to Assyria and repopulated Israel with Gentiles from lands that Assyria had conquered. Many of the remaining Jews intermarried with the incoming Gentiles, and this produced the Samaritan people. The Samaritans were not pure in their worship, and they were not pure racially. When the Jews of the northern kingdom lost their racial and religious purity, they became detestable to the Jews of the southern kingdom. They were no longer considered Jews, and they were called Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans came to hate each other 
and they did not associate with each other. The kingdom of Israel became known as Samaria. It was named after their capital city. This is the context of the encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. The Samaritan woman was obviously surprised that Jesus would request a drink from her. Because Jesus was a Jew, and she was a Samaritan. She knows that Jews and Samaritans are supposed to hate each other. He was a man, and she was a woman. According to Jesus' Jewish custom, it was not proper for any man, especially a rabbi, to speak to a woman in public, yet alone a Samaritan woman. And as we shall see, the Samaritan woman's character was immoral. And according to Jewish custom, Jesus would have been defiled by touching her water pot. But Jesus was not impressed with man-made traditions of the Jews. He came to do his Father's will. Verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus doesn't address her question directly. Instead, Jesus deals with what is important, her salvation. Jesus answered her by basically stating that she was asking the wrong question. The question shouldn't have been how he could ask her for a drink. The real question was why she hadn't asked him for a drink of living water. Because first, Jesus had the gift of God, Romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 5 tells us that eternal life means having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And Ephesians 2 tells us that eternal life is truly a gift. It is not something we can earn. It is only something we can have by trusting in a Savior. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. No sinner is excluded from this offer of the gift. It is a gift of grace available to everyone. And secondly, he was the Messiah who came to give living water to all who are spiritually thirsty, including her. We need to understand that we are all spiritually dead and that we need what Jesus has to offer, eternal life. When we ask for this living water, Jesus promises to give it to us. John 4, 11, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? The woman did not grasp the spiritual nature of Jesus' statement. Of course Jesus is greater than Jacob. Jesus created Jacob. The Samaritan woman was trusting in the wrong thing for her salvation. She was trusting in her lineage, her physical connection to Jacob. Verse 13, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman that he can give her water that is better than the water that Jacob gave. The living water that Jesus gives will quench her thirst permanently for all eternity. She will never thirst again. Christ completely satisfies. He completely saves. One drink from Jesus and your thirst is quenched for all eternity. Verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus was focusing on the ultimate. The Samaritan was, woman was focusing on the immediate. The woman still had not made the connection that Jesus was talking about spiritual water. All she could think about was the freedom of not having to do the chore of carrying water back and forth from this well to her home. She was only focused on the physical world. 
Jesus changed his approach in verse 16 to help her see her desperate need for a savior. Verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. He asked her to bring her husband back to the well, knowing that she did not have a husband. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. The Samaritan woman covered over her immoral lifestyle by telling Jesus that she did not have a husband. She hid the truth from him because of her shame. She spoke a partial truth, but not the whole truth. So Jesus spoke the whole truth, which was that the woman had been living an immoral life. He went straight to the heart of the matter. What if Jesus spoke the whole truth about us? We all have sin and shame that we don't want exposed. She was looking for love in all the wrong places and in ways that never satisfied her soul. She was on her sixth man and continued to live in sin and shame. However, Jesus is the light that exposes the darkness. Plato said that we can easily forgive a child in the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. Jesus brought her sins into the light, not to condemn her, but because self-sufficient people don't come to Jesus. They don't see their need for a savior. We need to recognize that we have needs that only God can satisfy, needs for forgiveness and eternal life. We don't value the doctor when we are healthy. We value the doctor when we are sick. We are all spiritually sick, but we don't always know it. Jesus also wanted her to realize that her real need was spiritual and not physical. Salvation was what she really needed, not an easier way to get her daily water supply. Jesus didn't die on the cross just to give her some helpful hints for happier living. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for her sins. To come to him for salvation, we must realize that we are a guilty sinner in need of a savior. Finally, Jesus wanted her to know that he was God. Jesus told her everything she ever did, and he revealed his omniscience. He wanted her to understand that he was much greater than Jacob. He was the Messiah and that she was in desperate need of a savior. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The Samaritan woman did not deny her sin. I always find that refreshing. She actually passively acknowledged sin because she didn't challenge Jesus' statement She didn't say something like, husband number three definitely wasn't my fault. (laughs) She didn't do what most of us try to do in justifying her sin. She recognized her sinfulness. She immediately realized that Jesus had special knowledge by calling him a prophet. Verse 21. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus directed her to the worship of the Father. Jesus clarified to the woman that a time was coming when the specific location of her worship would not matter. Salvation has to do with placing your faith in Jesus Christ, not going to a specific location. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. All religions are not equally valid. The Samaritans had a false religion. They didn't know how to worship God. Jesus declared that salvation is from the Jews. The Messiah is from the Jewish people. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshiper the the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. God seeks worshipers, and the worshipers that God seeks are the ones that worship him in spirit and in truth. We were created by God to worship him. God is spirit, therefore true worshipers must have God's spirit within them to be able to worship God. 
Therefore, only believers can worship God. To worship God in truth means to worship him as he, is re as he has revealed himself to us in his word. We must worship the one true God the way he is revealed. Worshiping a false God keeps you from being a true worshiper. If you worship God as you conceive him to be, apart from the truth of God's word, you are worshiping an idol, a figment of your imagination. We cannot know the invisible God except as he has chosen to reveal himself through his written word. Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God, made flesh, is the supreme revelation of God to us. In John 14, 6, Jesus says that he is the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Jesus clearly represents himself as God, and he did explain everything to her. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, who concealed his identity as Messiah from the self-righteous religious leaders, declared openly to this sinful Samaritan woman that he is God. Jesus was saying that he was the only one who could satisfy her deepest need, her need for forgiveness of sin and for a relationship with him. The Samaritan woman was looking for other people, all the men in her life, to meet the need that only Christ could satisfy. This is a beautiful passage about God's love for fallen humanity. Jesus, the God of love, is seeking this sinful woman to be a worshiper of the Father. He does not want to leave her in her sin. He wants to transform her into a righteous child of God so that she can enter into an everlasting relationship with him. Jesus enters into her shame, and her sin and shame, and he is not ashamed to be associated with her. Back to Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, God says that we were created naked and unashamed. Verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Adam and Eve had nothing to hide outwardly or inwardly. There was no sin to break their fellowship with one another or with God. Adam and Eve were in a right relationship with God and with each other. All relationships were healthy and they felt no shame. Then comes Genesis 3. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Once Adam and Eve sinned, all the relationships were broken, and shame became a part of the human condition. Sin brings shame, which leads to covering and hiding. Therefore, Adam and Eve hid from God, they also sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves because they felt exposed to one another and exposed to God. But fig, tree, but fig leaves don't cover the nakedness of the soul. Man became a sinner that felt naked and unclean and was about to be cast out from God's presence. Verse 21. Genesis 3, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. God shed the blood of an animal which was sacrificed for man's sin, and he clothed Adam and Eve with garments of sin. Only God can properly deal with our sin and shame and our spiritual nakedness. The innocent was sacrificed for the guilty. A blood sacrifice was required to cover man's sin that separate him from a holy God. God goes on to promise that he will provide a savior that will crush Satan and conquer death. Thus the salvation story begins. It's a story where Jesus makes it a point to search out sinners who know shame like the Samaritan woman and like us. 
and he seeks to redeem them and bring them into his family. Shame says that if you really knew me, if you really knew my sin, all of my sin, you would turn away and run from me. You would not associate with me. Jesus says that I do know your sin and everything about you, and I invite you into a relationship with me. Jesus knows shame, not because of his sin, because he is without sin, but because of our sin. In order for Jesus to deal with our sin, he enters into our shame so that in him we may know no shame. The story of Jesus on earth is a story of, of shame from start to finish. Jesus was conceived out of wedlock, born into poverty in a borrowed manger, rejected by his own people, the Jews, associated with sinners, homeless, abandoned by his friends, spit upon, crucified on a cross, exposed and uncovered for the sins of mankind, where God turned his face away from him, and finally, his body was laid in a borrowed tomb. But... Hebrews 2 says, Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne. Jesus knows shame, but by his life and death, Jesus came to redeem us and remove our shame. There is no shame in Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are or what you've done, Jesus desires to enter into a relationship with you, just as he desired to enter into a relationship with the Samaritan woman. One of the beautiful things about the gospel is that the gospel is inclusive. God invites outsiders to come into fellowship with him. Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only are we not condemned, we are given a new position. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The opposite of shame is honor. 1 Peter 2 says that we are a chosen people. We're, we are wanted by God. We are a royal priesthood. We are part of God's royal family. And as priests, we have direct access to God. We are a holy nation. We are set apart for God. And we are a people belonging to God. We belong. We are no longer outcast. We are part of God's forever family. God doesn't run away from us. He runs towards us. God's grace is such that he used Peter, the one who felt the shame of denying Jesus three times to declare these truths to us. Romans 10, 11. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. God has chosen to honor us and he will never put us to shame. Why? Our sin has been dealt with and there will never be a reason for us to feel shame before God again. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. God doesn't fix us or repair us. He makes us new. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God takes our sin and shame and gives us his righteousness. Jesus invites us to exchange our rotten, putrid life for his perfect one. This is the great exchange. Now when the Father looks at us, the only thing he sees is the righteousness of Christ. And there is never cause for shame in him. We now rest in the reputation of another. And it is a glorious reputation. Let me close with some lyrics from a song called How Many Kings. The song gives us a small glimpse of what Christ has done on our behalf to deal with our sin and shame. How many kings stepped down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? 
And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Only one did that for me. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are utterly amazed and humbled by your great love for us. Thank you for saving us from our sin and our shame. It, may our hearts continually worship you. Help us to set aside the things that interrupt our worship. And may we never, never, never be ashamed to call you our king. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.